For we have received from his fullness grace upon grace. Father, we ask that you would open your law that we might behold wondrous things therein. Amen. You may be seated. I don't know if you got everything you wanted for Christmas, or maybe you got something for Christmas and it wasn't at all what you wanted. It was a complete letdown. I've, I've had some Christmases where they give you these gifts and then you realize it's something that you gave a few years ago and it was just re-gifted back to you. <laughs> then there's other ones where you open this gift and then you realize it is way more than you ever asked, thought, or imagined. John 1, verses 1 through 18, and the rest of the passages that we read, tell us about this incredible gift that we get, the gift of God himself. So there's only two points to today's sermon. What did you get for Christmas, and uh, what are you giving for Christmas? But what, are the, the, when you, what you get for Christmas, there's four things that this passage tells us about this gift, the gift of God himself. And, and they're all four incredible things. The first thing is it's, it's, an, incredible, it's an incredible conjunction. And, and I don't mean this for y'all that are um, English teachers. You know, conjunctions, right? That's normally when you like, put two sentences together by using a preposition, right? Like a conjunction like and or but, and that joins them. What I mean, there's this um, incredible conjunction. What do I mean by that? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. I love Eugene Peterson's translation of the message, which says, the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. Did did you catch the beginning that says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and nothing was made except that it came from the word. So before anything existed, there was nothing but nothing but nothing except for God. And then you see that there's this incredible conjunction. God speaks the world into existence. And, and here's my thing. Um, has anyone had to go to the Orlando airport in the last couple of weeks? Last week, I had to drive my dad down there. And I think that if there is such a thing as a God of justice, <laughs> he's going to make whoever designed these airports have to live in them for eternity. No, I joke, but... but Here's the thing about this God who created the universe. It wasn't enough just to create the universe and to stand aloof. He actually says, if it's good enough for y'all to live in it, I can live in it. And he comes and dwells among us. Jesus, the creator, the logos, the very principle that ordered it all, comes and makes himself one of us. God is wedded to flesh and blood in the womb of a first century Jewish girl. This incredible conjunction. The second thing that we find in this, this present that you and I get over Christmas is that it's, it's an incredible, it's an incredible condescension. What do I mean by that? Condescension. Like normally condescension is, is the lip that I get from my teenage daughter. No, just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> She's like super respectful. I love her. But have you ever had someone that speaks to you condescendingly? But what do I mean? I don't mean condescension in that way. I mean condescension in a different way. I mean the way that it was in 2003 um, when I was stationed in Korea. And, you know, most other places and most other bases, you can go home for Turkey Day. Um, but because we're, we were at that place where the North Koreans still haven't signed a peace treaty with the South Koreans. We were in a, still in a peacekeeping mission 50-some years later. Well, now 70 years later. Um, so in 2003, we have all the, the soldiers there in their civilian clothes because it's Turkey Day. They're, they have the day off. But what did I have to do? I had to put on my dress blues, all my ribbons, all my medals, all my stuff. And you go down to the mess hall. And they're all coming in in their sweatpants and they're just relaxed and they got the day off. And I got an apron on with the battalion commander, and we're just slinging gravy and mashed potatoes and turkey onto those plates. Because the whole point is that one of the beauties of, of the army is that, for example, if, if I had a company of men, and there was 120 of us, if I ordered the food rightly, and I said, okay, I need this amount of beans, bullets, and whatever, right? If I ordered the right amount, they would get fed. But if I didn't order the right amount, um, it's, it's not in any of our manuals, but it's an unwritten rule. Officers eat last. 
So if you didn't order the right amount, you're the last guy in the chow line, you come through there, and at the 120th person, you get nothing if you didn't order it right. The whole point is it's servant leadership. You see this Jesus, this Logos, who, who does this amazing, incredible condescension. He stoops down to our level. You see, most other world religions, most other even philosophical systems, and listen, I, I love Marcus Aurelius and the Stoics, but even Stoicism says, hey, work your way up to God. And God says, no, I'm working my way down to you. He humbles himself in order to exalt us. Glory to God in the highest. He doesn't come to, to get glory. He comes to give glory. It's an incredible condescension. The third thing that you get in this amazing gift of Jesus is not just an incredible conjunction or an incredible condescension, but you get an incredible conjunction. No, not conjunction, sorry. Um, contraction. I'm getting my, my points missed. Incredible contraction. What do I mean? Contraction, right? And contractions aren't what Mary was just having in that little stable, though that is one of the ways of defining that, right? Here's what I mean by an incredible contraction. I mean, it's like in Aladdin that my little four-year-old discovered that, that, that movie, right, where, where, where the, the genie says, all oh, the powers of the universe can hit an easy little space. It's all, everything of the universe. You see, God with just one word puts the whole universe into motion. He flings stars, planets, galaxies. That's in that prayer C, right? As they call the Star Wars prayer. But God creates everything. You know, even the furthest planet out there and the furthest star out there is, what, 12.7 billion light years away? And that's still nothing but a little bit of lint on God's belly button, if you want to think of it that way. And we live in this little, like, backwater of this little wing of the Milky Way and this little nebula of this, and, 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 and our planet is insignificant when you think about that. But it's God who's the creator of everything. Did you catch that in Psalm 147? It says, who's told his cold where to go or the frost? It's, it's basically paraphrasing um, chapters 37 and 38 of the book of Job where in that, he even says, who's told every lightning bolt where it should go? God's like, oh, I want the lightning bolt to go there, and I want the, that snowflake to fall there. God's in charge of everything. There's this moment in the book of Acts when Paul is talking to the Stoic philosophers in the Areopagus. They're right next to the Parthenon. And it says there, he says, for God has determined the times and places where everyone will live in order that we might seek him out. There's not a single hair that falls from your head that he doesn't already know about. And he's, he's still in that much, he's, he's that powerful, and yet he, he contracts himself and makes himself small. Do you know how small he makes himself? So I remember um, a friend of ours gave us a little book, What to Expect When Expecting, right? When my daughter was 14 years old. Well, 14 years, not when she was 14 years old, but she was 14 years ago before she was even born. Uh, and um, What to Expect When Expecting. And and it takes you through like all these, day one, here's what to expect, day two, right? Day one, right? So the God of the universe made himself what's called a zygote. Anyone know what a zygote is? A zygote is a unicellular organism. For 30 hours, you were a zygote in your mom's womb. For 30 hours, the God of the universe became a unicellular cellular organism. Think about that divine contraction. All that big to all that little. All that little. This incredible contraction. And, and how small did he make himself? So even 10 months later as he's born and then two years later in what sometimes they call the fourth trimester, right? Um, the logos, the one who is the word himself has to learn words from his Jewish mother, and learn how to say those words, Abba, Ima, Daddy, Mommy. So an incredible contraction, which leads us to the fourth thing in this incredible gift that you get of God himself coming to you, an incredible commission. So why do we get this gift? You know, there's the what did you get for Christmas, and why did you get this gift? And Galatians tells us that. We just read from Galatians chapter 3 and chapter 4. Um, 
most theologians think that this is probably the earliest written book of the New Testament from the late 50s, early 60 A.D. Um, some of the Gospels are like a little bit after that, maybe this Mark's in, in 60-some A.D. But Galatians is the earliest book. It tells us the why. But God, in the fullness of time, sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to make us God's children. And that's exactly what it says there in John 1 that we read, right? To, to those that believe in him, he gave the right to become the children of God. But right before that, what does it say in John 1, right? It says, he came unto his own, that which he made, his own creation. The creator comes to his creation and says, I'm here. I've written myself into this amazing story, into your story, because I want to have a relationship with you. I want to get to know you. I don't just want to boom commands from, from a mountain far off. I want to live life with you. And what did we do? We betrayed his trust. What did we do? We persecuted him. In fact, the 28th of December is celebrated as the Feast of the Holy Innocents, right? And what happened in that? When Herod hears that, that the king of the Jews has been born... And he's, Herod is called the quote-unquote king of the Jews, but he's actually from Edomea, which is across the Jordan River. He's actually the usurper, and he hears that the rightful king has been born. What does he do? He orders his henchmen to go to Bethlehem and find anyone below the age of two and kill them. And that's, it's, it's easy to like write Herod off as being the bad. He's, he's the bad guy in this narrative, and you know, we, if I would have been there, I would have been like that wise man, or I would have been like the shepherds, or I would have been like Mary, Actually, I think that when push comes to shove, we probably all would have been a lot more like Herod. Maybe not ordering the death of innocence, but the idea of like, you're God, you made this universe, but actually, couldn't you just run the universe my way? Couldn't you just do things my way? But why does Jesus come? Jesus comes because of his incredible commission, his incredible commission. He comes to make us his children. When you read the book of John, the Gospel of John, the interesting thing about the Gospel of John, in the whole Gospel, it refers to us as the children of God. Not once does it ever refer to us as the sons or daughters of God. Because John is doing that as a rhetorical device, as a liter literary device, to, to tell us how amazing, exalted Jesus is. He's called the Son of God. We're called the children of God. But the whole point is that God wants to adopt us and bring us into his family. And, you know, if it's like what Mark Twain said, right? Family's a bit like fish. Three to five days later, they start to stink. You're like, I can't wait for my in-laws to, like, leave after Christmas. Or I can't wait for my kids to leave and finally have a house here in New Smyrna back to myself. Some of y'all are smiling. <laughs> but the whole point Jesus comes to restore right relationship between us and God. That we might cry, Abba, Father. Abba, it's, it's one of the first words we ever learn. We learn yes, we learn no, but we also learn how to say daddy, right? John Paul II said that it's very easy to become a father, but it's actually hard to become a dad. Think about that. And I don't know, you, you may have had a great dad growing up. You may have had a very imperfect dad growing up. But you have a perfect father in heaven who wants you to say, Abba, Father. He wants to restore that right relationship. So this Christmas, on this seventh day of Christmas, God wants to remind us that we get an incredible conjunction, an incredible condescension, an incredible contraction, but an incredible commission because Jesus goes to the cross to restore that right relationship between us and his Father. He wants us to be adopted so that we can cry, Abba, Father. Father, we thank you for this incredible gift of your Son. We thank you that you have made us one and adopted us into your family and we can call you Father, and we can call everyone else brother and sister. So, Lord, as we reflect on that, we ask, Lord, 
but let us know what we need to give you this Christmas. Just as you have given yourself to us, may we give ourselves to you and ourselves to others this Christmas. We ask this all in Christ's strong name. Amen.